it sounded like an explosion. I mean, the sound was so loud. It was, it was so visceral. They could literally feel it in their chests. Immediately, they began looking left and right, desperately trying to figure out what could have possibly made that noise, some speculating that it must have been a lightning bolt that struck too close for comfort, others thinking that it must have been some kind of equipment malfunction. But in the moments that followed, as they investigated, the crew of the SS Pendleton quickly realized that the sound they heard was no stray lightning bolt, it was no equipment malfunction, but the sound that had rocked them to their core was the sound of their boat splitting in half. The SS Pendleton had been sailing off the coast of Massachusetts uh, when it encountered one of the worst storms ever recorded in that area. For hours, they struggled to right the ship to sail their way through the storm and bring themselves to safety, but the storm proved too strong, the waves too resilient, and eventually they could do nothing but look on in horror as their boat literally ripped itself in half. The captain and three of the crew members immediately lost their lives as their half of the boat crashed into rocky terrain and sank immediately, leaving the majority of the crew, including the second in command, Jack C. Brewer, left alone on half of a boat that was barely afloat. They were unsure of what to do. Of course, the most amazing part about this story is not what happened next, but more importantly, what didn't happen next. Later on, when Jack Brewer, the second in command, was interviewed about this particular moment in time, he commented that he remembered that they didn't panic. In fact, he was surprised at the, the aura of confidence, it's confidence that seemed to permeate the boat because, as Jack said, we weren't scared, we knew exactly what to do next. Jack immediately ordered that all unnecessary equipment be jettisoned into the ocean, thrown overboard so that they would have a chance of stabilizing their ship and making their way through the storm, giving themselves a little bit more time to hopefully be rescued. And so the crew immediately went to work. Anything that wasn't tied down, anything that wasn't immediately essential to their survival in that moment was thrown overboard, jettisoned into the sea so that they could stabilize their position in the water. And after they'd done so, when asked what they did next, Jack simply commented, we did nothing. We had done all that we needed to do, and we were able to stand confident in the middle of that storm and wait for help. And the miraculous thing is that they were indeed rescued. Their actions that day bought themselves enough time to be rescued by the Coast Guard. One of the most amazing uh, rescues in Coast Guard history ever recorded took place that day as the remaining crew of the SS Pendleton was safely brought to shore. Honestly, as I read that story and even as I recount it to you this morning, I can't help but be amazed, awestruck by the persistence that those men had, the peace that they felt, the confidence that they had in, in the midst of one of the worst storms that they and really anybody else has ever experienced. They were in the thick of one of the most deadly scenarios they'd ever experienced, and yet somehow Jack commented that the crew at large was able to stand confident because they knew they had done all they needed to. I kind of wish that I was able to carry that same confidence with me in my day-to-day -day life, right? I, I'm not facing some kind of deadly storm. We're not doing that regularly, each and every one of us, and yet I think that we can all resonate with the idea that we would love to find a little bit more peace and a little bit more confidence as we walk through this life, which on its own is undoubtedly chaotic. I wish that I had the peace that they had so that the next time that somebody comes up to me and says, man, I'm so sorry, I just heard the news that, that, that your mom or, or your, your sister is in the hospital, I hope you're doing okay, that I could look at them and say, yeah, you know what, honestly, it, it, it's tough, but I'm not scared. I'm not panicked because I know that God's got me. Man, I'm, I'm so sorry, I just heard the news that that you lost your job, you got laid off, dude. I, I hope everything's okay. I'm sure you guys are panicking. I, I, I'm sure you're, you're not sure what you're gonna do next. Yeah, it, it's a little bit scary, but I know exactly what to do next. I'm gonna trust that my God's got me. Man, I just, I, 
I just heard the news. I can't believe that your house burned down. You guys lost everything. What are you supposed to do from here? <laughs> yeah, honestly, dude, it's, it, it is scary in some ways, but in other ways, I know that I've got a big God, and I know that he's going to take care of me. If the kind of mindset that I'm describing here is resonating with you, I hope that you'll listen in this morning because what we're going to do is we're going to look at exactly how God promises us that level of confidence and peace in our everyday lives. And while it's not the passage that we're going to spend the majority of our time in this morning, what I really want to do is I actually want to start in the book of Matthew. Uh, so you don't, you don't need to turn there. We can put it up on the screen. It's Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 25. This is Jesus talking, and he says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus has this paradoxical sounding teaching that, that really is a roadmap for us to the kind of mindset, peace, confidence that I'm describing here this morning. Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, whoever on his own strength, his own power, his own might, whoever through his own effort would attempt to carve out this kind of life that I'm describing, the sort of life that allows us to stand confident in the middle of the storm and say, I've got a big God, he's going to take care of me. Whoever would attempt to do that on his own is never going to find that kind of peace and confidence in this life. But... Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, whoever is willing to surrender everything that they have, everything that they are, over to God, over to Jesus, whoever is willing to engage in that kind of radical surrender, that individual, those are the people that will inevitably, in the midst of the worst storms of this life, be ready to stand confident in the middle of it all. Jesus says that the key to that mindset, the key to that kind of perseverance, to that kind of joy, to that kind of confidence, is surrender. And just like the crew of the SS Pendleton, how they knew that they, in order to, to save themselves, in order to bring themselves through the storm, they had to throw it all overboard. Jesus asks similarly for us. He says, you need to give over everything that you are to me, and in turn, I promise that I will deliver to you peace, confidence, and joy in this life as you walk through the worst storms. So what I want to do this morning is I actually want to look in Mark chapter 10. We're going to spend the majority of our time there this morning looking at a story, a story of a young man who had the opportunity, who was given the offer that Jesus gives to us. He says, surrender everything that you are to me and I will give to you the confidence and the peace that you're looking for. And in this story, this young man chose to walk away. And my hope is that by examining this story together today, as we look at the kind of surrender Jesus calls us to, that in leaving this room this morning, we will make a very different decision. And instead of walking away, we will choose to lean into surrender. And in so doing, find the confidence that allows us to stand firmly in the middle of the storm. Let's pray together real quick. Father God, we are so grateful for every opportunity we have to be able to praise you, to be able to worship you. I pray this morning that as we open up your word, that we would uh, realize the kind of surrender that you are calling us to. That we would identify it, that we would lean into it, and in so doing, that we would find more confidence in you and in the person of Jesus. God, it's in your heavenly, holy, precious name that we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so like I said, we're going to look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 is where we're going to start. Now, if you've been around the church for any period of time, uh, this is probably a story that's going to sound familiar to you. It's the story of the rich young ruler. Okay, so I'm just going to read through the story real quick. We'll read through it together, and then we'll kind of take a step back, we'll walk through it piece by piece, and we'll walk away with just a few points that, that I believe will sort of reveal to us the kind of radical surrender that Jesus is calling us to, the kind of radical surrender that gives us that level of peace and confidence. So Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it starts like this. It says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Now already this story is interesting. Not just because of the question that's being asked, but more because of the person that's asking it. Okay, so it says, and as he was setting out on his journey, that's Jesus, Jesus and his disciples, they're getting ready to pack up and move on to the next town. They're getting ready to to continue on in their ministry journey together. So as they're getting ready to leave, a man, this is our rich young ruler here, ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the reason that the the, the rich young ruler is a particularly interesting individual is because uh, rich young rulers weren't exactly like all over the place back in those days, right? This young guy would have been recognized by pretty much everybody in that area. He would have been uh, a, a person of prominence, a person of, uh, of authority, a person who had a lot of education. People would have known this person just by looking at him. Okay, so it'd be like if you were walking through, uh, you know, like the mall or something with your pastor, and all of a sudden, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, the richest men in America, if they like ran up and knelt before them and asked them this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Everybody in that area is going to be paying attention because they're like, what in the world is happening right now? So not only is the rich young ruler asking Jesus a question, but now Jesus has an audience because people are looking on. People are curious. They want to know what this interaction is going to be. And Jesus said to him in response to his question, he said, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Jesus has this really clever way of, when he interacts with people and they ask him questions, he gives them an answer and at the start of their conversation, and, and sometimes it's kind of clear that that's not really the answer. Jesus is sort of playing into what they think he's going to say, right? So he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus kind of looks at him and he responds, dude, you're, you're an educated religious guy. You know that the law is these things. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Honor your father and mother. You know the Ten Commandments. You know the laws that I've given to your people. You know this, So just do that perfectly. You want eternal life, just do it perfectly. You know what the law is, you know what the rules are. If you just do that without flaw, without error, if you just live that life perfectly, you'll be fine. Now the trick is, we all know that's impossible. All the people looking on this situation know that it's impossible. That's kind of the whole point of the law. That's why throughout the law, God gave his people instructions for how to have their sins forgiven when they inevitably broke the law because they were going to break the law. They weren't going to do it perfectly. So we all know that this is impossible. They knew it was impossible, but this is the answer that Jesus gives to the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler's response is very telling. It says that he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us what tone the rich young ruler had here, but I can't help but read some arrogance into this reply Because basically, Jesus just looked at him and said, I want you to live the law to a T perfectly, and then you'll be fine. And the rich young ruler basically responds, oh, like if that's all I have to do, I've basically been doing that since I was a kid. Ever since I was a kid, ever since I was a youth, I have kept these laws perfectly. All these I have kept from my youth. So in other words, if all you're saying is I have to live the law perfectly, I'm good. I've already done that. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. This is the offer. This is the moment. This is what Jesus says to him. If you sell everything that you have, all of your property, all of your possessions, if you take all your wealth and you give it to the poor, to the needy, then I will allow you to come follow me. Now, this is a really interesting offer, not just because what Jesus is asking for from him is is a lot, but it's an interesting offer because of what he ends that offer with. He says, and come follow me. It's the same language that Jesus used with every single one of his disciples. This is the offer that Jesus gave to every single one of the apostles. He called them from their careers. He said, leave behind everything that you have. Leave behind your jobs. Leave behind your families. Whatever, whatever wealth you may or may not have, leave it behind and come follow me. It's entirely possible that if the rich young ruler had responded differently to this conversation, we may not have heard about the 12 apostles but of the 13. 
It's entirely possible that Jesus would have had another core follower, another core disciple, if the rich young ruler had responded differently. What Jesus is offering him is revolutionary to his life. He says, sell it all, leave it all behind, and come, follow me. And of course, if you've read this story, you know how it ends. (sighs) Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The call was too great. What Jesus was asking for from him felt like too much. Now, you may be immediately asking yourself, Ben, why are we looking at this story to talk about surrender, right? Clearly, this is a young guy who isn't saved. He doesn't know the gospel message. He doesn't know how to inherit eternal life. And Jesus tells him, basically, like, you have to surrender yourself to me in order to have eternal life. It's, it's the basic gospel message that we preach every week. And you may be thinking, like, why is this the story that we're focusing on? When, when you know, perhaps maybe you're sitting there and you're going, I've followed Jesus for most of my life. I know exactly what the gospel says. I'm not sure what this has to offer me. My hope is that by examining this story, we will come to a deeper understanding of the kind of surrender that Jesus calls us to, not just before we have been saved by him, not just before we have been brought into his family, adopted by him spiritually, promised eternal life, but also after. Because the reality is every single one of us, as we have walked through this life, you know and I know that just because we walk with Jesus does not necessarily mean that life gets easy all of a sudden. And so many times what we attempt to do is we attempt to carve out for ourselves some measure of confidence as we face trials and tribulations in this life even those of us that have walked with Jesus for decades. And Jesus says here in this story and many times throughout Scripture, if you would just continue the process of surrender, if you would continue to gain a deeper understanding of the kind of radical surrender that I'm calling you to, you would be able to walk through this life with a greater level of confidence and peace. And so my hope is that by examining this story, by piecing it apart a little bit, we will come to a deeper understanding of exactly that, what Jesus is calling us to, the kind of radical surrender that he asked of the rich young ruler and the kind of radical surrender that he continues to call you and I to every single day. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to just point out three areas of our lives that I believe Jesus has called us to surrender in this passage. Three areas of increasingly difficult levels of surrender. And the first is simply this. I believe that we're called to surrender our stuff. We're called to surrender our stuff. When I was in second grade, my best friend was a kid named Marley. Marley and I got along really well. We became fast friends immediately. It was the kind of like friendship that you see in movies where two kids who don't know each other run into each other and immediately are best friends. That was me and Marley. We would hang out together. We would play games together on the playground. And eventually we got to the point where we started hanging out at each other's homes. Now, I remember the first time that I was ever taken to Marley's house, the first time my parents ever drove me over there so I could hang out with him. We drove up to his house and and I noticed a couple things pretty quickly. I We drove up and I went, wait a second, Marley's got multiple basketball hoops in his front yard. (laughs) Like, I don't have multiple basketball hoops, this is cool. And then I I went into his house and I walked around and I looked around and I go, wait a second, Marley's got a pool in his backyard, this is awesome, like I don't have a pool in my backyard. Marley's got a trampoline back there, that is so cool. And then I get into his room and I go, Marley's got like not one, not two, but three different video game systems. I had one, and I, I, I couldn't help but be amazed at everything that he had. And I remember as I eventually left, uh, my silly, stupid, selfish grade brain couldn't help but think to myself, man, I kind of wish that I had been born into Marley's family instead. It seems like he's got a lot of great stuff. It is an undeniable reality that our stuff, that our possessions, that our money bring with them some measure of happiness. And and you can say that it's shallow, you can say that it's incomplete, I would agree with you, but we would be insane to not just acknowledge and admit the reality that our stuff, our money does bring with it some kind of happiness and some small measure of security. Even now as a grown man, not a second grader anymore who's just jealous of his friend's stuff, now I, I look at the world around me and I go, man, if I just if I just had a little bit more money coming in, 
What kind of a life could I provide for my kids? What kind of security could I provide for my wife? What kind of home could I provide for my family? And objectively speaking, if I had more money, I could do more of those things. There is some reality to our stuff, our money, our possessions, bringing with it some measure of happiness and security. And and I want to be careful because I think sometimes when we read a passage like this, we immediately jump to, well, the solution is just to get rid of everything. If I can just live as destitute as humanly possible, then I'll be happy. That's how I will achieve the kind of life that Jesus wants me to live. I mean, we saw that at the beginning of Mark. Jesus says to the rich young ruler, he says, if you just sell everything that you own, you lack one thing, go sell all of your possessions and come follow me. And so sometimes I think we get this idea in our heads that we just go, well, if I just... If I can just get rid of more stuff, if I can live as minimally as possible, that's what God wants for my life. And I want to be very careful. That's not what I'm saying. When, I, when I'm asking us to surrender our stuff, I'm not trying to imply that your stuff is an issue. In fact, I would argue there are plenty of places throughout Scripture that you could go and look at where the underlying message is, if you steward well the resources and the stuff that God gives you, He's going to entrust you with more stuff. There there are plenty of places where you could make that argument. Jesus, God, doesn't have a problem inherently with your stuff. The problem here is not one of possessions, but of posture. The problem here is not one of possessions, but of posture. Okay, the rich young ruler's possessions weren't the problem. The problem is the way in which he was standing with those possessions. And the rich young ruler, in his case, he was holding them so tightly that nothing else could get through. He was holding on to his stuff so tightly that that was the only place that he found security, the only place that he found confidence. And Jesus calls him out on it and says, dude, if you really want the life that I have to offer you, You need to come to the realization and accept the hard truth that your stuff, your possessions, will never provide for you the life that I offer. It will never bring you the same level of peace. It will never bring you the same level of confidence. It's never going to work like you think it will. Your stuff is going to fail you. And so when I say that we need to surrender our stuff, you might even rewrite that a little bit and say, instead, we need to surrender the idea that our stuff is going to bring with it any meaningful measure of security, confidence, or joy, because only Jesus is able to do that. And that's what Jesus is getting at. When he says to the rich young ruler, go sell all of your things and come follow me, Jesus isn't saying, I have a problem morally with the stuff that you possess. Jesus is saying, I have a problem with your posture. What you are doing right now is finding your security and your confidence in your things, and I need you to come to a a, a radical understanding that it is me instead that you will find that confidence and that peace in. If you really want eternal life, if you really want the kind of peace that I'm able to provide you both on this side of heaven and the next, you need to hear this, your stuff is going to to fail you so we need to surrender our stuff we need to surrender the idea that our stuff is going to bring with it any meaningful measure of security or happiness the second point is this we need to surrender our sovereignty we need to surrender our sovereignty now I'm a big fan of alliteration. Sovereignty just means that, that it, to be sovereign over something is to have control over it, right? We need to surrender our control, okay? We all, as we walk through this life, have this misguided belief that somehow we have a meaningful measure of control over what happens to us and over what, you know, what kind of problems and, and things come our way. And when those problems do come our way, we have an, another misguided belief that somehow we have control over how those problems will be resolved. And ultimately, we need to surrender the idea that that's the case. So this is where I want to look at actually the conversation that happens immediately after Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 23 is where we're picking up. The rich young ruler's just walked away. Jesus turns and looks at his disciples. It says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Now remember that, the disciples were amazed at his words. We're going to circle back to that in just a moment. 
But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, which is just Jesus' fancy way of saying it's very, 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 very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. A giant camel can't fit through the eye of a needle. A rich person is not going to easily fit into the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Now, this is where I want to circle back around. It says that the disciples were amazed at his words. And then as Jesus clarified, they were exceedingly astonished. And they said to him, then who can be saved? The reason I want to focus on this is the disciples are not rich dudes. Right? Remember, they're, they're dudes who have left everything behind. Whatever careers they may have had, whatever money they may or may not have had, they left it all behind to follow Jesus. These guys are living off of the generosity of the towns that they go in and minister to. They're not sure where they're going to sleep next. They're, they're relying on donations from other individuals. They're not wealthy guys. And so it's weird that they would be astonished by what Jesus is saying. You'd almost think that they would be excited. Jesus says rich people will have a hard time entering the kingdom of God. And you'd almost expect the disciples to go, oh my gosh, thank you so much. That, that makes me so happy because I'm not wealthy. I have no money. And... and if the rich people are going to have a hard time, then I'll be fine because I'm not rich. I got nothing. I have nothing to my name. I want to investigate this a little bit more, though, because to understand the disciples' reaction, you have to understand the culture that they were living in. So remember, at the time, Jesus had not yet died on the cross. He wasn't resurrected. The gospel message as we know it wasn't widespread. Jesus was trying to get people to understand that he was the way, the truth, and the life. But it wasn't until after his resurrection that people, even his own disciples, really started to understand and put that message together. And so in the Old Testament, and even in Jesus' time now, the way in which men and women would have their sins forgiven when they inevitably broke the law was through animal sacrifice. Now, animal sacrifice had become a, a, an integral part of the Jewish economy at the time, and, and a lot of the animal sacrifices that happened took place in the local temple. Because remember, not everybody back then was a farmer. Not everybody back then had livestock. And what's more is even for those that did, there were very specific rules and regulations over the kind of livestock that they could use for animal sacrifice. It had to be a very particular animal in a very particular condition that God gave, gave them these instructions and said, in this way, you will have your sins forgiven. Now, rich people, what they would do is they would go into the temple they could spend all their money. They would lay down their cash and they would host these elaborate animal sacrifices where they would have their sins forgiven very publicly. Poor people, on the other hand, were hurt on two fronts. One, they didn't have very much money to pay for the animals to have sacrifices. And two, when they went into the temple, there was a little bit of a, of a scheme going on, and Jesus calls it out later in his ministry, where basically they went in and uh, the temple had this special temple currency that you had to use. And... Uh, you would have to exchange your money for temple currency. And as you can kind of guess, because it's a scam, they would give them a certain amount of their money, and they would give them far less back in temple currency. So poor people, not only did they have not have enough money on the front end, but especially after they did this whole temple currency exchange thing, they had even less. And in many cases, poor people in this day and age had to just walk through their lives not having their sins forgiven. It was a thing that they couldn't physically afford to do. It was a, a practice that they couldn't afford to take part in. And so you might start to see now why the disciples are a little on edge. They hear Jesus say, it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples start to panic because they start to realize, wait a second, the rich people, they're able to have their sins forgiven. We, we can't afford that. We haven't had our sins forgiven according to the law in quite some time. We haven't been able to afford that. And so they start to panic and they say, well, then who can be saved? If the rich people who can afford animal sacrifices, if the rich people who are actually able to partake in this forgiveness of sins aren't able to make it into heaven, then what hope do we have? And I love Jesus' response here. Because on the one hand, there'd be some selfish measure of justice if Jesus was able to look at them and ease their fears and go, 
oh yeah, no, don't worry guys, I'm, I'm flipping the script on you. For a long time, rich people have always had it good, but in heaven, it's gonna be the opposite way around and poor people will reign supreme. As a person that doesn't have that much money, that would be great to hear Jesus say. He doesn't say that though. Jesus actually takes the question immediately out of their hands and, and as he does so often, he flips the script on them and he says, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God, with man, it is impossible. Jesus leans into their fears. The disciples say, what hope do we have? And Jesus goes, yeah, that's a really good point. You're not able to afford to have your sins forgiven. You guys are broken people who've sinned and broken the law. And so, yeah, according to the efforts of man, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. It's never gonna work. You're never going to be able to do it. He says, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, you guys are trying desperately to figure out how you can make this happen on your own. You are convinced that you have some measure of control in your fate and in this situation. And you need to understand that it is impossible for you to achieve what you are hoping for and desiring for on your own. It is only through the person of Jesus that it will ever be possible. With man, it's impossible. You have no sovereignty. You have no control. You never did. With man, it's impossible, but not with God. He says, for all things are possible with God. Jesus says, you need to understand that you don't have control. You can't fix the problem of your sin on your own. And what's more, for those of us that have been following Jesus for a long time, you can't bring to your life the level of confidence and peace that you require to withstand the storms of this world on your own. You can't do that. Jesus says, it is only through my person, it is only through God, it is only through him that we are capable of achieving this. I mean, we started with this in the Matthew passage. Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We started with the concept that when you attempt to achieve this kind of peace and confidence on your own, it is never going to work. And so when I say that we're called to surrender our sovereignty, what I mean to say is that we are called to give up this idea and desperate grab for control. We are called to give over the idea that we will ever have any meaningful impact on our fate in that capacity and that our only hope is to surrender everything that we have to the person of Jesus because we can't do it on our own. So we're called to surrender our stuff. We're called to surrender the idea that our stuff is ever going to bring with it any meaningful sense of security, happiness, or peace. And we're called to surrender our sovereignty. We're called to surrender control. We're called to surrender the idea that we can actually achieve this on our own because the reality is that we can't. And the last point I want to make for us this morning is we are called to surrender our one thing. We're called to surrender our stuff. We're called to surrender our sovereignty. And we're called to surrender our one thing. I want to look again at Matthew 16, 25. Jesus looking at the rich young ruler, it says that he loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Those four words may be the most pivotal words in this entire exchange between Jesus, the rich young ruler, and his onlooking disciples. You lack one thing. And the reason that this is so crucial, the reason that this is so pivotal, is remember what happened just moments before this. The rich young ruler asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers him and he says, you know the law, just live it perfectly. To which the rich young ruler replies, Teacher, all of these I have kept from my youth. I have lived the law perfectly all of my life. And I called this out at the beginning. You, I, and everybody else looking on knows that that's not true. We know that he didn't live his life perfectly up to that point. We know that he's a messed up dude because we're all messed up people. We know that he's a broken individual because we're all broken individuals. Everybody looking on could see through the facade. Everybody looking on, everybody reading this story today understands you didn't live your life perfectly up to this point and yet Jesus looks at him, loves him and says to him, you lack 
one thing. But Jesus, he objectively, mathematically doesn't lack one thing. He lacks many things. He's a broken person. He's not lived his life perfectly. So what do you mean? What are you getting at? He doesn't lack one thing. Jesus is so good at getting to the heart of the issue because he's really, what he's saying is, yeah, I know that he's a broken person. I know that he's messed up. I know that he has made more than one mistake in his life. I know that he lacks more than one thing. And yet, there is one thing that he consistently turns to time and time and time and time again for peace, for confidence, for support. And that is the one thing that he needs to be ready to walk away from if he is going to meaningfully engage in the kind of radical surrender that I'm calling him to. Jesus says, I get it. I know that he's a broken individual. I know that he lacks more than one thing, but there is only one thing that he is holding on to tighter than anything else, and that is the one thing that I want from him. And so you might be asking the question, you said, Ben, we need to surrender our one thing. So what is it? Well, I'll be honest. I think as soon as I said that, I think as soon as I said we need to surrender the one thing, I would bet that a lot of people in this room, something popped into your head and you went, oh, that one thing. It is the one thing that when the cards are down, when everything seems to be stacked against you, it is the one thing that time and time and time again that you find some level of comfort, confidence, peace in outside of the person of Jesus. And you have turned to that one thing time and time and time again. When life gets hard, when life gets difficult, when everything seems to be falling apart, when you are in the middle of the worst storm in the world, on the proverbial half of a sinking vessel, you turn to this one thing over and over again. So it's going to be different for every single one of us. But I'll tell you this, everybody's one thing will fit into one of two categories. And I want to talk through that just real briefly here at the end. For some of you, your one thing will fit into this first category. And this first category, I'm going to, des- I'm going to describe it as this. Your one thing will be much like the rich young ruler's one thing. If you fit into this category, your one thing is probably something that on its own is not harmful or, in, or, or something pretty innocuous. Something that on its own isn't a bad thing, right? We covered the rich young ruler's one thing isn't inherently evil. Jesus isn't saying that money is morally bad. Jesus had a problem with his posture, not his possessions. And so for some of you, in this first category, your one thing will be much the same, where your one thing is something that is very harmless on its own, something that may even be a blessing given to you by God. But what you have done is you have elevated that one thing to an unhealthy place in your life. And if you fit into that first category, for some of you, it might be be just like the rich young ruler. It might be your money. You might find confidence in your 401k, And you say to yourself, you know what? If if everything else in my life falls apart, if everything else is torn away from me, at least I have that. It might be your home. And you say, man, if if the economy collapses, if, if everybody I know leaves me, if I'm left alone and destitute, I will have this home and that brings me comfort in the worst times. It might be a relationship. Relationships, by the way, are a blessing. God designed us to be in community with one another. But your one thing that you find comfort in, that you cling to time and time again, that you find confidence and peace in outside of the person of Jesus might be another individual. You may have placed all of your confidence, all of your peace on another relationship with a spouse, with a friend, with a brother, a sister, a mother, a father. And those relationships, by the way, again, are good things for us to have in our lives. But what you've done is you've elevated that relationship to an unhealthy standard in your life. And you need to hear this morning that those people will ultimately fail you because we are all broken. If your one thing fits into that category, I need you to hear this verse. 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Forever. 
The world and its desires pass away. If you're holding on to your money, your house, a relationship, something else that's of this world, that again, on its own is not inherently harmful, but that you are finding all of your peace, all of your confidence in, that thing will inevitably break, fall apart, fail you. You will inevitably be left alone. Your ship will sink because those things will all fade away. It is only God that endures forever. So some of you may be in that first category. Your one thing is much like the rich young ruler. It's something innocuous, something on its own that is harmless, but you have elevated to an unhealthy position in your life. And some of you this morning, you're going to fit into this second category where your one thing is inherently toxic. Your one thing is inherently destructive. It is a pattern of behavior, a rhythm of life, an addiction that you have slid into and you have been finding yourself incapable of escaping it for as long as you can remember. And even as I speak this morning, you may be thinking to yourself, I know that that thing is bad for me. I know that it is bad for my relationships. I know that it's going to hurt me. And yet, in every season of life, when, when, when everything seems to be breaking apart, when I am in one of the worst storms that I have ever experienced, it is only this thing that has ever brought me some shade of happiness, some pretense of comfort and confidence and peace. This is the only thing that I have. And I'm incapable of walking away from it because I know that the minute that I give this up, I will be thrust into the middle of anxiety I will be thrust into the middle of situations that are beyond my control and I will be unable to cope because I have been using this thing that is so inherently toxic and destructive, this pattern of behavior, this rhythm of life, this addiction, I have been turning to this over and over again to find peace. And for those of you that fit into that second category where your one thing is inherently destructive but you can't seem to walk away from it, you need to hear this verse from Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. This is Jesus talking. He says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? If you then... You, right here in this room, who fit into the second category, if you then who are broken, if you then who are evil, if you then who are so far on their own from God, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, or in other words, if you who are broken know how to find some pretend happiness in this broken thing, how much more does your heavenly father have to offer you? Your heavenly father who's perfect, who always loves you, who always sustains you, how much more does he have to give? How much more does he have to offer? Because I promise you, this path that you are on, if this is your one thing, it will lead you to a path of destruction. You will chase away everybody who loves you because you will cling to it above all else and it will bury you and Jesus instead is offering you another path out. He says, give it up, surrender it, and turn to me instead. And even though the thought of leaving that thing behind is anxiety-inducing, Jesus says, I promise what I have to give is worth so much more. And whether you fit into that first category or that second category, I want every single one of us to hear this last passage, and this is where I want to end. This is the last bit of the story. Okay, so this is Mark chapter 10. The reference on there is so wrong, I apologize. It's Mark chapter 10, 27 through 29. Uh, Peter began to say to him, so Peter speaks up. Jesus has just told them, with man it's impossible, but not with God. With all things are possible with God. Jesus has leaned into their fears and confirmed their, their nightmare scenario that on your own you will be unable to make this happen. You can't do this. And Peter speaks up and he says, see, we have left everything and followed you. So Peter says, what about us? Because you're saying it's impossible. What about us? We're not like the rich young ruler. We gave it all up. You called us and said, come follow me. We left our homes. We left our families. We left everything behind and we followed after you. So what about us? 
And Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus says, Peter, you have left it all behind. And I need you to hear that for those who are willing to surrender it all to me right here and right now, for those people, I will give to them now. I want to focus on these two phrases. They will receive a hundredfold now in this time and in the age to come eternal life, a promise for today and a promise for eternity. He says, today I promise you that you will receive far more than you have given up. And in the age to come, I will promise you that you will be with me in eternity. I promise you eternal life. And that is good news for every single person in this room. If you are somebody who has never heard the gospel message before and you wandered your way in here today, or if you are somebody who has been far from God their entire lives and has just begun to ask the question, what does Jesus mean to me? This is good news for you because you need to hear today that the only path to real satisfaction, the only path to eternal salvation is through the person of Jesus. He has given that to us as an open invitation today. And for those of you who say, I've been following God for decades, I have lived my entire life following after him, you need to hear that Jesus promises us in this time a hundredfold. Now, I don't want to be all prosperity gospel. Jesus isn't promising you a bigger, better house if you leave your current one behind. Jesus isn't promising you literal more children if you leave your family behind. Jesus says, what I have to offer you in this lifestyle that I have called you to, which requires surrender, the end result in this life is far more peace, confidence, and joy than you would ever receive on your own chasing after your own ambitions. He says, I've given you a family in the context of the church. I have promised you an eternal home with me. And so when you are willing to surrender and leave it all behind, like the men on the SS Pendleton, when you're willing to recklessly throw it all overboard, when you are with reckless abandon ready to follow after the person of Jesus, he says, I promise I promise you now in this life, you will receive peace. You will receive rest. And I will give you the confidence necessary to stand in the midst of the storm and say, I've got a big God. It's all going to be okay. 